Welcome to another segment of Ecosystem Engaged, the Not So Daily Show. This is a uh, really special uh, segment for me uh, as I speak to our High Commissioner. Uh, well, when I say our High Commissioner, the High Commissioner for New Zealand to Singapore, um, Her Excellency Joe Tyndall, um, who is um, just like the rest of us, uh, you know, working remotely. Uh, you know, from her residence, but keeping engaged, keeping all the wheels turning, uh, and keeping all our citizens safe um, in, in, in Singapore. So welcome, uh, Your Excellency. And I'm looking forward to a really fascinating discussion relating to New Zealand's response to the pandemic, which I think everyone's familiar with. It's, uh, it's treated as a benchmark, and we keep our fingers crossed. Um, and everything to do with, uh, you know, digital trade, global trade, and all the other stuff that you've been doing to keep, um, keep the lines running between Singapore and New Zealand. So thank you for that. It's a pleasure to be here and to be talking with you today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Um, so let's first start with, you know, how you're doing. I mean, you're like the rest of us, you know, trying to, um, you know, live in isolation, learning to live with that, but you've obviously got um, a lot of responsibility just to make sure that, um, you know, New, New Zealanders living in Singapore are safe, first of all, and, uh, and lots of other things that involve both the governments working through many things. Um, how have you looked after yourself and how have you uh, kept engaged with your teams and all the other things that you need to do remotely? Well, it feels like uh, our team has been working remotely and uh, as a split team, in fact, for a very long time now. So uh, uh, we're not a big high commission uh, in the first instance, um, and splitting in two has has um, been a bit of a challenge. So, for example, um, I, my new deputy head of mission arrived here in January, um, and uh, we had about, uh, I guess, four or five weeks um, where we were together, um, and then uh, suddenly we've had to to be in in uh, opposite teams because it it didn't make sense to have both the high commissioner and the deputy high commissioner in the same team. So we've been communicating remotely for weeks um, and weeks now. Um, I guess I'm, uh, it, it's, it's, there are some good things and bad things about this. On the, the good side, um, I'm uh, lucky enough to be in our official residence, um, which uh, is a very large place. So, in, in fact, it's almost too large for, for one person. I'm, I'm feeling a bit rattling around. It's built for representation with a huge dining table that seats 20 people. Um, and, of course, I can't uh, entertain. I can't have people here on, on the terrace or for dinner or, or anything uh, at the moment. But uh, I, I do have uh, luxury of space. Um, I am keeping sane by uh, going for a long daily walk rain or, or shine, uh, and uh, the, uh, the neighbourhood, uh, I think, is, is particularly lovely. In fact, you can see, uh, I have seen the, um, uh, you know, the, some of the implications of, of reduced human activity with, for example, um, little tribes of macaque monkeys coming out um, of the parks and and roaming and, and rummaging around uh, the, uh, the rubbish bins of, of uh, the, the, the leafy neighbourhood. Um, so that side has been really good. Um, it's, it's not been a hardship to be working from home. Um, but at the same time, um, it is really difficult to keep up connections. It's actually quite tiring to do Zoom calls or um, you know, WebEx calls or whatever it is um, all day and not to have the, the face-to-face um, interaction. Um, I think, too, uh, that we as uh, um, New Zealanders here on a posting, um, there is a, a kind of psychological exile at the moment. Of course, we're here by choice, and, and we're doing um, jobs we love, representing um, our country uh, and um, looking after the interests of our, our, our citizens here. Um, but at the same time, uh, when we have had, um, up until next week actually, no direct flights at all between New Zealand and Singapore, that feeling of psychological isolation um, is, uh, is very real. 
So it's been important, um, critical, in, in fact, to um, maintain lots of contact, more than I would normally have, uh, with family back home. Um, and I don't know about you, but uh, it's been quite a, a phenomenon as well that uh, with the, the COVID pandemic, contacts I, I hadn't heard from for, for some time or I hadn't reached out to for some time, we've reconnected and, and made sure um, people are, are all right and found out what we're, we're each up to, which has been really lovely. Yeah, no, for, for, uh, for sure. I think, um, I think we all are um, socially distant, but I think less emotionally distant as I see it, because we are reconnecting with a lot of people. And, um, and I, I, look, I, I have to say, having been to the official high commissioner's residence and, you know, as New Zealanders, I think we've all had opportunities every now and then to be there. And uh, I think we take a lot of pride. It's a very beautiful property. It's in a very beautiful spot and really, really uh, well kept. And, um, and I think, you know, you have, uh, you've been a very gracious host many times of having opened that house to um, many New Zealanders uh, living here and from overseas that um, come in uh, for various events um, and, and, and dinners and it's been lovely. I'm looking forward to being able to throw open the doors to uh, um, uh, entertain people and, and uh, socialise in, uh, in the not too distant future. I really am. Um, and uh, yes, it is a great asset. Um, uh, we uh, have had this property since the early 1960s. We rebuilt on it, but uh, we've had it for a very long time. And it's um, a very important and special place for us. Yes. And look, we, we know that Singapore has always been a very... Um, key uh, nation in terms of um, you know partnering with New Zealand o over the de over decades. Not it's it's not it's not new. But I do want to congratulate you on um, you know the first year anniversary of um, uh, having completed one year of the enhanced partnership treaty between Singapore and New Zealand. Um, would love to know more about that. Uh, but before we get into that, I'm, I'm um, I do want to have it you know ha cover that off because I think it leads to some really key um, aspects that we've observed in the last few weeks as well, just in terms of how New Zealand and Singapore have partnered together to keep supply chains going and the role of digital trade. But before we get into that, I want to talk about New Zealand's response. Now, it just, you know, as a New Zealander, uh, I can't begin to tell you, obviously, we're, we're, one, we are always concerned about what's going on back home. But beyond that, the, the pride that you feel in terms of how it's been dealt with uh, by government, industry, communities, everyone coming together. Um, just, um, just wanted to get your, get your thoughts on, on that and how, I know it couldn't have been an easy ask. It seems, really, it, it seems to have been pulled together really well, but I'm sure there's a lot that's gone into it. Um, it'd be great to get your perspective on that. Well, of course, my perspective is from a distance. Um, having been here. Um, but uh, I, I think um, uh, the, the, we are keeping our fingers firmly crossed. Um, the, the response uh, and the, um, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, I think there is only one uh, active case of COVID-19 remaining in New Zealand now, um, the, the response has been uh, remarkably effective. Um, and uh, we just really hope uh, that, you know, we've looked at, at uh, the experiences of others and seen how rapidly uh, things can um, spike and get a little bit, bit back out of control. So it's really important, I think, not to, to rest on our laurels and think, OK, we've beaten this. Um, the, uh, um, the virus is uh, pernicious and, and uh, you know, could, could come back for sure. But I think the response um, uh, we took was um, founded on science, obviously, um, but also uh, backed up with a, um, a very clear communication um, uh, approach. And that was really, really important to, uh, first of all, set out what uh, the framework was, the, the um, series of alert levels, um, but then, uh, and, and explain what would happen um, at each of those different levels. To reinforce that with daily communication, both from uh, the Prime Minister and the Director General of, of Health, um, who uh, really 
um, I, I think, delivered super clear messages to uh, the New Zealand public and created a team spirit. There was very much a, a feeling of we are in this together. Um, and uh, although it was hard, um, it was very clear um, that uh, it wasn't just the public um, sh experiencing the pain. The pain was being shared, including, for example, by the Prime Minister. Um, so some of those little human touches um, where she, for example, did um, uh, some work on, on Facebook while she was in her pyjamas um, or um, did interviews from her home uh, with the, you know, her little daughter's nappy bucket in the background. <laughs> Um, and, uh, uh, the, and, and when she said that uh, there had been a special exemption for the Easter Bunny uh, to avoid the, uh, the lockdown uh, and uh, continue to deliver Easter eggs, those things, I think, really um, delivered um, compassion and kindness along with uh, the, the very severe um, constraints that were being placed on, on personal freedoms. Uh, for um, quite a, a, a long and, and difficult period. And it was really tough um, on people. I think there were a couple of natural advantages for New Zealand. Um, in essence, we've got a, a very large moat around the whole country. Yes. Um, you know, we, we don't share um, a land border. Um, and it is quite uh, easy, or comparatively easy, to, to contain things. Um, in a way that is, is much more challenging for, for other countries. Also, um, coronavirus came to our shores somewhat later. It was well into February um, before the first case um, arrived uh, in New Zealand, uh, whereas, uh, of course, for Singapore, it was uh, in mid-January, mid 23rd of January or whatever it was. So we had um, the advantage of a, um, a few extra weeks to see what was happening elsewhere and to um, prepare uh, for what needed to happen. But go early, go hard um, was the, uh, uh, the, um, the plan, the strategy, uh, and that meant there was a period of um, considerable pain, but hopefully uh, that, that uh, our pain has paid off and uh, we're now in a position to be able to, people are, are very much embracing going back to uh, normal life um, and being able to um, catch up with friends, dine out, um, all the other things that uh, are back open. No, ab absolutely. And it's like you, you and I were discussing the other day um, that you know this is a humanitarian crisis first and foremost, and the economic crisis is a fallout of that. And I think the government's approach or the whole of government's approach in, in, in New Zealand, and, and, and when I say whole of government, I mean every um, everyone involved in government, shadow government, you know, cutting across parties, coming together. Um, I think there's been uh, the response has been tremendous. It's been um, it's been true leadership at all at every level, um, you know, with empathy and compassion. And, and I think you, you you articulated that really well. I want to share a few things. Uh, for the benefit of um, you know our viewers and and uh, people watching this, is um, you know my 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 take on this and you know I um, so first of all I'm going to personally acknowledge and I'm not a I have no political inclinations and I can but I want to acknowledge that uh, if anything you know we have the coolest prime minister on the planet and I think she has done a tremendous job demonstrating that you can actually take some really hard decisions but you can take Take those decisions, being mindful of how people are getting impacted, and 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 you know managing their emotion as well. And I think she did a fantastic job. I, I saw a video of hers with um, you know kids from school, and she wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one session with kids so they could ask her questions of um, you know what um, the impact of the coronavirus was going to be, and, and because you know kids. Uh, can get anxious and they might not bring it up with their parents or, or teachers and so on. And, and I, th I thought that was really cool. Um, I also, uh, from, a, from a response perspective, High Commissioner, I saw a few things. I saw very quickly, um, you know, the covid.govt.nz website come up and it addressed every facet of COVID that was impacting people and businesses. Right? Everything from the healthcare scenarios 
to you know business economic support it even had a um a number that people would call um if they were stressed so for counseling it had a counseling hotline so people could call uh, and i thought that was just a really good holistic way to look at things because here was um, you know a government that was thinking about um you know the implications of the psychological uh, burden that people were carrying as well so no i i, I think there was a, um, a a clear recognition um that uh, enforced isolation and and uh, being cooped up um in uh, either alone or with uh, um, a small family group was going to create tensions um, exacerbate uh, um, underlying issues that might be there and and you know uh, uh, generate some mental health issues as as well and in, in a very big way um, important too to have a, a, a kind of one place to go a, a single source of truth as it as it were um, particularly because um, as with other countries policy was having to be developed and put into place within an incredibly short space of time. So really, um, yeah, very important to um, be able to communicate it uh, and, and uh, for people to be able to find it and also uh, for it to be updated um, because things had to be adjusted and tweaked uh, as the uh, um, alert level went on. That's, that's right. And, and look, I, we also, you know, as, as technology analysts, obviously, we follow that space very closely and um, was very impressed by the, um, uh, you know, the, the various leaders that drive various ministries and, and you know, the, for example, the CIO for the Ministry of Education, Stuart Wakefield, I mean, him and his team working on plans to um, enable kids, underprivileged kids who, who didn't have access to uh, internet and devices, um, you know, put a plan in place, but then also rally the industry together, right? I mean, you saw everyone from the telcos to device vendors, everyone chipping in and saying, look, we're here and we'll back this and trying to enable about 100,000 kids who didn't have access to that infrastructure um, so that they could continue on learning from home. And, and I think it's been, uh, it's been a great example of, um, you know, how you can use technology and how the industry can come together to create greater inclusion um, and, and reduce that digital divide. So I thought that was, uh, that was something worth highlighting. It was, uh, no, it, it's, it's well worth it uh, because uh, again, um, and this wasn't the education sector, but uh, from our own purposes, our, our home ministry suddenly um, had to work remotely. And uh, um, the pressure on the, uh, our IT systems and everything were, was massive. So people were having difficulty kind of um, uh, uh, getting into uh, to the system. Um, uh, and ironically, I, I um, one day tried to call the service centre um, for um, a problem I was having. Um, and uh, they couldn't get back to me because they were too busy <laughs> dealing with um, um, maintaining connectivity in, uh, in the, the wake of COVID-19. Um, I eventually sorted myself out. But... But things did remarkably quickly settle down. Um, and uh, we had uh, the technology, the ability for um, all of our staff um, to be able to, to uh, work from home and, and communicate with each other without crashing our systems. Um, I'm quite fascinated that the High Commissioner has to call in the, um, the customer support team sort things out. <laughs> I'm glad it got sorted out and I'm glad, I'm very impressed that you sorted yourself out actually. Um, but, you know, moving on to some of the things that you've been driving, um, we know how passionate you've been about this enhanced partnership treaty. And, and we saw, obviously we've, we've seen various uh, implications from a digital trade as well as economic cooperation uh, perspective over the last 12 months. But, um, nothing more important than what we've seen in the last couple of months. And um, I know that, you know, you've been in the press a fair bit. Uh, you know, I saw pictures of you at Changi Airport. I think you were trying to unpack the meat off the, off the aircraft that was coming from New Zealand. Um, so, you know, getting hands-on there. So we'd love, love to hear what's, uh, what's happening on that front. 
not too hands on with the meat. <laughs> uh, for, for um, any consumers out there. Um, yes. So uh, I think, well, we've, we've done an awful lot. Uh, of course, um, in May last year, so just on a year ago, we had um, Prime Minister Ardern here um, for a, a, a flying visit. Um, and she signed, uh, along with Prime Minister Lee, the Enhanced Partnership Agreement. And that set up um, a really uh, powerful platform for collaboration between us, um, covering pretty well all sectors, um, defence, uh, security, um, trade and economic area, uh, the science and innovation, which has been huge uh, over the course of the year, and people-to-people -people links. People-to-people -people links has probably been the hardest um, uh, to uh, sustain in the, the last little while. But um, with the uh, um, arrival of the pandemic, um, that uh, really caused us to, to have to rethink how it was we were going to pursue um, the, um, all the things we had already agreed to collaborate on. Um, and equally have a rethink about are there other areas in light of what is happening to the world um, that it makes sense for Singapore and New Zealand to, to work on together. So the first thing was um, a, a conversation between our two trade ministers um, who uh, could see uh, that the uh, virus was um, going to very evidently disrupt global supply chains. So uh, they put out a, a statement together that committed to working uh, closely, bilaterally, uh, to keep supply chains open um, and to particularly ensure there was no restriction on, on uh, trade and essential goods, food and medical supplies in, in particular. Um, as Singapore and New Zealand have done, we, we then uh, um, promoted this uh, and, and uh, pitched it to uh, a number of other countries through a number of different international fora. Um, and uh, the, uh, the support for it um, has grown. Um, really, really important, I think, because the tendency um, in these circumstances as your economy is, is facing a, um, a body blow is to turn inwards. Um, but we felt it was vital uh, to send a signal um, and to, to use um, I guess the uh, the belief we've both got in in free trade as as countries that that um, rely on export markets um, to to use that to uh, um, really commit to to working um, in an open and outward fashion. We then uh, you referred to going out to Changi Airport. Um, we then uh, put uh, substance to the words on a piece of paper. Uh, by setting up an arrangement uh, for uh, cargo flights between our two countries to deliver those essential goods. So bringing food to Singapore um, and uh, medical supplies uh, back to New Zealand uh, and to cooperate to ensure that that happened. So yes, my, my trip to Changi Airport, I was very excited to have an outing leaving home uh, for a moment was to go to the cargo terminal at, uh, at Changi, um, along with Minister Chan Chun-Sing, um, and to meet an Air New Zealand flight uh, that had come with uh, um, a cargo load of beef and lamb um, and uh, a few other things. But, um, you know, that would have been last year a, a totally unremarkable uh, thing. But in today's world, um, it was something that was worth uh, celebrating um, and, uh, and and really kind of you know saying look this is this is important we are managing this we are committed to helping each other out we are friends um, in need uh, and uh, we are working together to uh, um, look after each other's best interests so um, yeah a great feeling to to go out there and and to see the uh, uh, the Air New Zealand plane with the fern and the koru on its tail. Um, and uh, it, uh, yeah, it felt particularly patriotic that day. I can imagine. I mean, how, uh, how long has it been since we've seen that? Uh, that must have been an exceptional feeling. Um, and look, I, I think there's so much opportunity of trade between Singapore and New Zealand to, to and, and, you know, we know that Singapore and New Zealand are big trade partners in, in, various areas. Um, but then that also brings me to this whole 
with, with the pandemic, one of the biggest risks um, that you know, everyone had concerns about was, first of all, was food shortage. And it all links back to supply chains. So obviously, you know, between you know, yourselves and the Singapore government, both very proactive governments, you've, uh, you've taken the steps to address those issues. And that's a great example of how you can overcome some of those risks. But we know that this is not going to be a one-off, right? The supply chain risks will, get, um, will, will be uh, ongoing. And I'm sure there are many nations that are struggling with it which brings to the fore the whole concept of digital trade and making things much more uh, effective. Now, I know that New Zealand has been uh, very proactive in uh, you know, signing a digital economy treaty, not just with Singapore, but there was uh, there's the tripartite agreement with, with Chile and, and you know, there's lots of discussions where that's being, um, you know, that's being discussed. Where, but do you see, uh, a bigger role in that whole sphere of digital trade, especially for a market like New Zealand. And, and perhaps a great way for New Zealand to overcome the tyranny of distance that we've had um, and, and had to deal with for, for, for so long. Well, uh, first of all, I, I have to um, uh, slightly correct you in a legal sense. The uh, Digital Economy Partnership agree uh, Agreement between New Zealand, Singapore and, and Chile um, the uh, ministers announced the substantial conclusion of negotiations. Uh, the, the agreement um, is yet to be formally signed, um, but we hope that uh, is going to be able to happen virtually uh, very, very soon. Yes. But yes, we, we see that uh, um, agreement as critically important in a number of ways, um, and more important uh, in uh, light of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So, uh, first of all, uh, we see it uh, as a pathfinder agreement, one that uh, um, helps to, to set standards um, and, and, and be a benchmark uh, for um, facilitating digital, the digital economy and digital trade, while at the same time um, protecting uh, the um, you know, businesses and, and uh, you know, individuals. For the, from the risks that are also associated with, with it. So um, a Pathfinder agreement that we hope uh, we will, as we have in other circumstances, encourage others to, to join. The second thing I think is that um, uh, with uh, COVID-19, um, as I said earlier, we um, believe it's, it's now is really the time to reinforce the importance of open and, and free um, trade, not to turn in on ourselves. And uh, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement is one example of us leaning in, leaning forward uh, to um, really demonstrate um, how um, keeping trade open and facilitating it um, is going to be vital to our economic recovery, all of us. And the third part, I think, is um, uh, around the role of digital um, itself. Now, of course, we're not talking about digital food here. Yes. Um, food is, is going to cross borders um, and it's going to be real. Um, and, uh, uh, but what the digital uh, um, economy can do or digital trade can do, I think, is um, help manage that. Um, and and uh, also, uh, you know, while we're in a, um, an environment of, of um, being at a distance uh, uh, where our, our business representatives can't come here uh, to, to do things, uh, where documentation and so on uh, will need to be managed in a, in a contactless sort of way, uh, different from what we might have um, done in the past. And, You'll have to excuse me, I'm definitely not um, a technological expert in anything at all. Um, but, but while we're, we're endeavouring to, to come to grips with keeping those supply chains open, um, digital trade is going to facilitate it. And, and we see our Digital Economy Partnership Agreement as the foundation document for helping us uh, to, um, to take that further in both our countries and um, beyond. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. And I, I do apologize for jumping the gun on that uh, and letting the cat out of the bag. And uh, I hope that um, the treaty is signed. Uh, 
Um, but um, I, I have been known to jump the gun sometimes, occasionally. No, um, no, it's it's the legal niceties. You know, um, I, I come from a, a background where, you know, things are adopted, then they're signed, then they're ratified, then they enter into force. So, you know, from a legal perspective, there's a bunch of steps that uh, that have to be gone through. Yes. So we've concluded negotiations. We're about to sign. And <laughs> hopefully um, soon. It gives us comfort to know that, um, you know, these, these matters, which are very obviously very critical to our nation and, and economy and societies as well, are in the hands of people who actually look after the details and, and, and keep compliant rather than, um, you know, just, just come up with a dream. Uh, so running it to conclusion and following through, I, I think, is absolutely critical. So thank you, High Commissioner, for that. Um, you know, when we talk about digital trade, again, I'm going to come back to Singapore and New Zealand because, as you know, last year we were involved, you know, as ecosystem with um, the Monetary Authority of Singapore and working with MFAT, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in New Zealand, um, on, on showcasing the Enhanced Partnership Treaty and what it meant for the two economies. And obviously we were looking at a theme more around FinTech and that was to enable the financial trade between the two nations because every economy, the underlying um, aspect is uh, exchange of uh, currency and transactions. So given the similarities in New Zealand and, the ethos, and, and Singapore, the ethos uh, and the leadership as well, um, I think we, we both, both nations uh, typically jostle for the number one spot on the ease of business ratings from the World Bank. Um, you know, we're generally top of the charts with respect to transparency, very clear about data privacy. Both nations have very well-defined um, norms around data privacy and governance. And one of the things that comes to mind straight away is to facilitate this digital trade is to ensure transparent, uh, you know, transparency of information across both the markets. So you can actually have not just the, the actual physical process of approving and signing documentation, but everything is open between the two parties and between the two nations and, uh, and, and is literally treated as one economy from, from a digital standpoint. I think, and I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there more as a thought process for you know, our, our viewers as much, is the concept of having this cr a trusted data corridor between Singapore and New Zealand. I think if there are two nations that can trial this concept, I think Singapore and New Zealand, with what I defined earlier in terms of, you know, the, the ethos, the, the governance norms, just um, the, the focus on, you know, the well-being and privacy of, uh, of individuals and businesses, um, I think will really help fast track the whole digital economy uh, cooperation. And if New Zealand and Singapore can demonstrate that, um, it would be something that you know, could be expanded into um, other markets as well. So I just wanted to throw it out there. I'm not gonna put you on a spot to- um... No, you can't because I can't make policy. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, that's not my role at all. Uh, but uh, I think the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement um, provides a, a really powerful framework yes. uh, for thinking about those sorts of things. And I think um, another point I wanted to make a, um, a little bit earlier, but uh, um, it, it escaped me, was that uh, um, inclusivity um, and ensuring that, that uh, um, free trade uh, is, you know, sort of the benefits of free trade are felt um, across the economy is really important. Um, and that's another area where, where digital, I think, is, is um, uh, relevant. So for both of us, um, a large part of our economies are made up of SMEs. Um, and uh, um, so as we see it, uh, the deeper um, and arrangements like it um, are going to, to have to work uh, to the advantage of SMEs um, as well as uh, and not, not just the big companies, um, because we do want the, the benefits of uh, a digital economy to flow through um, to um, groups that might otherwise be um, somewhat disadvantaged, whether it's SMEs, whether it's women, whether it's the Māori community within um, New Zealand business community, um, we, we want uh, there to be equitable outcomes 
uh, when it comes to, to free trade under, under the DEPA and under other trade agreements we have. Um, that, that's um, you know, so good to hear, and thank you for articulating that, uh, High Commissioner. I, uh, I couldn't agree more. And just ending on the subject of response that New Zealand had, I wanted to, um, I also wanted to highlight an example, a, a, a real life scenario where a, um, how businesses have, um, have benefited and, and you know, they've managed to keep continuity of employment. Now, I'm not saying all businesses have. I think every, just as a business person, I can't emphasize enough how difficult these times are in every way. Um, now, you know, we consider ourselves fortunate being a digital business, so um, we're less impacted. But the reality is everyone is getting impacted. But in New Zealand, uh, as we talked about the response, um, I thought the practical approach that um, the policymakers drove in terms of driving the economic stimulus for business and um, job retention, I thought was tremendous. The, the um, you know, I heard stories where you know, businesses applied on a Tuesday and by Thursday they had a significant amount of money. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, obviously, some of these large companies in their bank accounts to ensure that they were able to retain their staff. And I thought, I thought this was this was a really good example. And I think this is we, we've always seen this in New Zealand, right? Because you make practical decisions and show sure, there's obviously risk that there will be some fraud. There always is, but the majority of people. Um, a decent law-abiding businesses or citizens, and uh, most of them have genuine issues. And the fact that the government was able to help them with the cash flow right there and then, and then deal with any negative implications later on, I thought was a very practical approach. And I just just wanted to just wanted to talk about that and and, and highlight that. Yeah, um, I think there was uh, um, you know a recognition. Uh, obviously, that things needed to be done very quickly, yes. that the um, imposition of a lockdown was going to have an immediate um, uh, uh, economic impact, um, and uh, that uh, vulnerable businesses uh, and uh, people employed by them were, were going to need to be protected. And obviously, some sectors uh, were more um, badly hit uh, and more immediately hit, tourism, um, travel, and so on, uh, than than others, but um, uh, I, yes, the uh, the decision was made to uh, make a wage subsidy available. I believe initially um, it was uh, um, for those who um, had suffered a, a thirty percent um, drop in uh, income since a, a particular date. But then that the the um, scheme was was rolled out further. Yep. Um, and um, it has been extended through, I believe, to September this year. But equally backed up with um, inf interest-free loans, um, uh, a $3 billion tax refund package, um, and at the same time, or in fact, somewhat a little bit after that, um, a, an announcement was made that, the, uh, that the, for those who had lost their jobs during this period, um, they would receive a, um, an increased uh, benefit uh, to help them through uh, the tough times. So yes, um, definitely, you know, really not the time to uh, to put in complicated means testing type uh, things. Yes. Uh, important to uh, uh, to help in the short term, um, but of course uh, now there is a um, a lot of thinking and further budgeting being done for um, the longer term recovery and and how to to manage that. Yes. And, and look, over the last couple of decades, um, you know, and, and this is credit to every subsequent government, um, is um, that they've actually enabled the digital infrastructure to, to be able to turn these things around that quickly, to be able to have the ability to use that digital infrastructure and evaluate and, and respond that quickly. So couldn't be done without that. Um, so, uh, so I think that's uh, that's commendable, and I'm you know I'm sure there's various government agencies that would have played that played their part in making that happen. Now I'm I'm going to come to finally I want to leave the best for the last, um, Joe, because your true passion is climate change, and, and you know people m m might 
have only seen you in this role um, as a as the High Commissioner here, but we know that your your previous role was um, as New Zealand's voice uh, in the UN as the Climate Change Ambassador. So um, um, would would love to get your thoughts on how's that how's that movement going, and, and what are the implications of the pandemic, and you know where do you see where do you see that issue, and is it, uh, it, it you know is it going to get sidetracked or is it going to get you know a little bit more catalyzed in this current context? Well, it's um it's a that's a big question <laughs> and a big topic, um, both good and bad. Um, in on the good side, um, the uh, Earth will this year see uh, for the first time in living memory. Um, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, purely because um, of the fact that so many countries, um, you know, air travel has, has ceased, um, uh, manufacturing um, slowed uh, in a number of areas, people were no longer traveling around cities. So um, greenhouse gases uh, reduced, uh, air quality in, in major cities, uh, in some of the worst polluted cities in the world, um, much, much better. So um, some, some good things there. Um, on the other hand, however, um, the, uh, the virus has been a complete distraction, of course. It's hard to get away from it, um, you know, either as an individual, um, as a business, and, and uh, as a government. Um, it is, you know, sort of an overriding um, uh, and urgent concern and it is much more in your face but I, I, um, I think a few weeks ago The Economist had a, um, a, a cartoon um, that uh, was a picture of a boxing ring with two fighters uh, inside the ring one uh, with the world um, as its head the other one with as a coronavirus pretty evenly matched slugging it out in the, the boxing ring but looming uh, waiting to come into the ring was um, an opponent that was twice the size of um, either of the two fighters, uh, and that was climate change. So that, I think, is the critical issue. We can't be diverted by uh, the, uh, the, the um, coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We cannot be diverted from what is a much bigger impending global disaster, but one that is not so in your face. Uh, as uh, um, COVID-19 has been. So it's been really interesting to, to see that um, the idea of flattening the curve um, has uh, informed uh, government policy responses to, to COVID-19 to avoid um, overwhelming health services and, and all the rest of it. Um, that same concept of flattening the curve um, has been something that uh, um, those seeking uh, climate action um, have been looking for as well. Because there's a real understanding that if we, if we don't get the emissions down in a reasonably manageable, slow way, the pace at which we have to drive them down, the curve we've got to, uh, to kind of reach is, is um, going to be well nigh impossible. Um, so really important, uh, there's a, um, a hashtag, uh, I think, build back better. Um, really important that as governments are thinking about how they help their economies to recover um, over the next year or so, um, they take into account the impacts of climate change and, and think about where investments should be made in ways that are, are going to help equally deal with that other looming global challenge that will not go away. Um, and uh, um, I think the last thing I would note was that my previous life um, as climate change ambassador was punctuated by spending in, you know, all my time in airports and conference rooms and in different parts of the world. Um, and that was a little bit ironic, um, I guess, in terms of what we were trying to, to negotiate. But it is another big challenge. Um, it's okay to do zoom meetings or webex meetings or whatever they are with um, a relatively small number of participants but it's really tough to get 195 countries together 
um, and, and virtually uh, and try and negotiate something. So um, the, uh, the UK has uh, taken a brave decision to postpone by a year the next ministerial meeting, um, the conference, to the uh, November 2021. Um, I really hope people can get back to, together and that we don't lose the momentum uh, for climate action in the meantime. It is critically important that we, we do keep, uh, keep things going now. And equally that we remember some of the good things uh, that uh, we experienced during lockdowns or, or circuit breakers, um, the peacefulness, the bird song, the cle cleaner air that we could breathe, um, and the kind of reduction in, in stress and, and um, the, the rush um, of being uh, in your normal day-to-day -day working lives. Well, we certainly hope so. And, and look, I think you summarized that really well. Uh, I, I love the, the, um, the hashtag you use, build back better. Uh, it's, um, it's certainly an opportunity. I, I think one of the things that will come out of this, Joe, is the ability for everyone to understand that there is such a thing as collective will. And if you have collective will, you can make things happen. And I think we're learning that through this corona, um, the, you know, this sort of coronavirus era that we're going through at the moment. Um, I think we are learning as societies, as communities, as, you know, industry and, and, and governments, um, you know, wherever the intent is right, that you can actually get this collective will to, um, to get across this. And hopefully we'll keep that going from, from a climate change perspective as well. I know that's a very big theme for you. It's a very important subject. Um, and I think it is, it is one that um, you know, everyone has to fight out together as well. Um, so um, let's hope that there's some learnings there for, uh, for us. Yes, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we can take perhaps I hope a little comfort and optimism from the fact that uh, when, when we are in crisis mode, um, that is the time we can innovate, um, we can uh, take actions we would normally you know, debate and, and uh, probably hesitate over for a very long period of time. We can be decisive, we can be innovative, um, and we can rise to the challenge. Uh, truly well said. And uh, thank you so much again. I, uh, uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. I, I, I hope we, uh, we keep that climate change movement. I know you've been a very, very key part of that globally uh, for, for almost a decade. So, uh, so thank you, High Commissioner, for your time. Um, I wish everyone well in, in New Zealand and in Singapore um, and, of course, around the world. And it's, it was an absolute pleasure. And I hope to have the opportunity to come for one of uh, you know one of the functions at your uh, at your residence soon, uh, and you know that'll be a, a breakthrough for everyone to be able to get out and, and meet each other. You'll be right near the top of the list, I mean, Whenever I can uh, reopen for, for business at the uh, at the residence and at the um, and at the High Commission, and hopefully uh, there will be an opportunity to travel to New Zealand um, in the, the not too distant future as well. Thank you for that, and I will uh, I will look look out for that invitation, and I look forward to getting back to New Zealand soon. Uh, so, so thank you, High Commissioner. Stay um, stay well. I hope you stay safe and uh, your family as well back home in New Zealand. And um, we uh, will will we'll continue our discussions um, soon enough. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Emma. Good talk. Thank you.